Per Minute is a weekly radio show from the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. Recorded live at WBAI 99.5 in Brooklyn every Wednesday at 9 p.m. RPM is about doing the work. The work to build a democratic socialist future. Each week, hear the latest news, analysis, and organizing experience from the minds and hearts of activists fighting every day in New York City. Join the movement at socialists.nyc. Yo, what's good, New York? This is Jack Devine, he, him, pronouns, and you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute, where I'm live from the WBAI studio. We're a socialist radio show and podcast for members of the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. DSA is the largest socialist organization in the United States, with over 95,000 members nationwide, and NYC DSA is its biggest chapter. We are run by our 9,000-plus members and organizers who are working together to build Democratic Democratic socialism in all five boroughs. A strike wave is brewing across the United States. Thousands of nurses, carpenters, miners, factory workers, teachers, and other workers are taking a stand against the big shots who steal the fruits of our labor. Unionization drives of academic, healthcare, and media workers have brought tens of thousands of new brothers and sisters into the organized labor movement. 60,000 IATSE film workers have authorized a sector strike in the entertainment industry, as hundreds of thousands of members in the other entertainment unions, like SAG, WGA, and the DGA, alongside Democratic Socialists of America, have committed to standing in solidarity. Has labor begun to turn the tide against capital in the United States? While Red for Ed and higher education unions across the country have launched major strikes of hundreds of thousands of workers united with their students over the past three years, the public sector stasis has yet to be broken in the heart of American social democracy. DSA members and other socialist labor organizers are preparing to bring the education strike wave to New York City. A huge coalition is building for the New Deal for CUNY. PSC, NYC DSA, and YDSA organizers at CUNY campuses are uniting for a plan that will pay academic workers a living wage and make CUNY tuition free. As a historian and union worker and organizer at CUNY, this fight is personal to me. NYC DSA Assemblywoman Ferris Safrant Forrest spoke with us at NYC DSA convention about the New Deal for CUNY and potential strike to make that happen. We'll also talk with my comrades in PSC and hear directly from YDSA organizers. But first, a special edition of the headlines. Headlines, October 6th, 2021. The New York City Council passed legislation to set minimum working standards for app-based food delivery workers. This is the first of its kind nationwide. Los Deliveristas Unidos, a grassroots collective of immigrant food delivery workers, began organizing last winter around the issue of bathroom access. State hospitals and nursing homes are preparing for waves of layoffs and resignations in response to New York State's vaccine mandate. While some hospital systems have near 99% vaccination rates, compliance varies widely among providers. Governor Kathy Hochul is considering calling in the National Guard to replace fired hospital workers. Schools are also preparing for staff shortages with as many as 10,000 teachers still unvaccinated and nearly 20,000 other school staff members not having received a shot. Over 500 school staffers have received religious exemptions. On Friday, a federal appeals court issued a temporary stop order on the city's vaccine mandate for Department of Education employees. DOE Chancellor Maisha Porter said in a memo to employees that she expects the ultimate ruling to favor the mandate. 
The Metropolitan Transit Authority pledged to increase enforcement of mask requirements after the subway broke a pandemic-era ridership record during the first week public school students returned to the classroom and city workers returned to their offices. MTA police have only issued 41 tickets for improper mask wearing since former Governor Andrew Cuomo signed an executive order last September allowing people to be fined $50 for failure to wear a mask. With the crisis at Rikers Island mounting, 12 people have died in custody so far this year, including five suicides. Mayor Bill de Blasio announced he would visit the jail complex for the first time since 2017. Meanwhile, district attorneys across the city continue to request bail, quote, on almost anything that's bail eligible, end quote, exacerbating already overcrowded jails. Mayor de Blasio blames correction officers' absences from work for the egregious treatment of inmates at Rikers Island. State Health Commissioner Howard Zucker, who presided over Cuomo's cover-up of nursing home COVID deaths, has resigned. The New York State Assembly is planning to release its report on former Governor Cuomo's misconduct, quote, very soon. The City Planning Commission has officially rejected the proposed tower at 960 Franklin Avenue, which would have cast its shadow over the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, killing many of their plants, and taxed the neighborhood's already strained infrastructure. Broker's fees for New York City apartments, which dipped during the pandemic, are reportedly now higher than ever. And in elections news, the Bronx Democratic Party nominated Udelka Tapia as its nominee for the special election in Assembly District 86 in Morris Heights, more or less ensuring her election. Tapia lost a primary for City Council District 14 of Morris Heights, Fordham, Kingsbridge earlier this year. And finally, the Manhattan Democratic Party nominated Cordell Clear for the upcoming special election in Senate District 30 in Harlem, which was recently vacated by Lieutenant Governor Brian Benjamin. Following her likely win, Clear will have to run again in the June 2022 primary, in which she is likely to face off against Ali Dini, a self-described Democratic Socialist who was recently endorsed by the Working Families Party. This concludes tonight's headlines. I'll be back later in the show. But for now, let's hear from Jack Devine. Our headlines are brought to you by The Thorn, an incredible weekly newsletter by NYC DSA Electoral Working Group covering local politics and radical activism. Subscribe at thethorn.nyc. On September 25th, NYC DSA held its annual convention where hundreds of delegates debated and voted on a number of proposals that helped set the organization's agenda and structure for the upcoming year. Delegates democratically announced majoritarian support for resolutions that fully integrated cultural organizations like RPM and Sing in Solidarity, a citywide mobilizer program and constituent services program, as well as endorse a campaign for a new deal for CUNY, which we'll be discussing with PSC organizers later in the show. Let's head to a report from convention for our day of day of interview with DSA State Assemblywoman Farah Safran Forrest and other DSA organizers. You're live at NYC DSA convention with uh, elected official at an NYC DSA member, Ferris Front Forest. Well, thank you so much for joining us again on RPM. Thank you, Jack. And so I just wanted to ask you, what um, proposals that have passed today um, have you excited for the direction of the organization? And what uh, what do you see as important in terms of maybe legislation um, for the organization, the movement uh, moving forward? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very excited about the New Deal for CUNY, um, particularly because, one, having the largest public uh, education system become tuition, you know, free is, I think, at the heart of the work of the socialists. But then to see what, whose lead we're following, we're following the young people, the, not young people, but the actual students who are demanding a quality education that is funded by tax dollars. And then we also have uh, labor that is advocating for um, adjuncts for fair pay, um, 
safety, improvement of facilities. Like this is the type of stuff that working class people should know is sh should know that should be a right, right? But then also this is the very transformation that we need if we're going to talk about the expansion of socialist ideas and socialist agenda. We this is the place to start with is in education. Um, especially in New York City's education. Um, the other thing that I'm really excited about is uh, constituent organizing. I think um, from some of the debates today, when we talk about how do we go forth spreading the socialist agenda, I think it must not be overlooked that there are six elected officials that are sitting in office today um, that are elected purely on the basis of people power, the power of members in DSA to organize, support, spread the word. I mean, when we talk about like my campaign, the amount of phone calls that were made, the amount of people who got involved, who spread, who talked about it at their job, talked it about talked about it in the neighborhood, um, got people who were for years disenfranchised, disconnected from their political system, but to see that there is a viable option to go against incumbents, to go in open seats, like come on now, that was crazy. And I still feel that fire today. And I want that replicated across the board in our neighborhoods. I mean, that's what we were elected for. So when we say constituent organizing, it isn't just, okay, um, I'll be answering phone calls. No, I'm talking about taking the same agendas, taking the same issues that we say are priorities that we know the community needs and making sure that our elected officials are pushing those very things in the community with the support of the people that want it. It's beautiful when I look at my office and what we've been able to do, constitute every person that first comes to the door or gets a phone, makes a phone call, is touched. That's something the other elected officials, other offices can't do. They have not been able to answer the calls. And then when we call, when we answer the call, we come back with real solutions. And then when we cannot find a solution, we say that this is a problem that we can organize around. And so we have been able to build tenant, um, tenant associations. People are getting unemployment. And to say that not only the community cares, but your elected official cares, this is what constituent organizing is all about. I mean, it still needs work, um, but to make it a priority, to make it part of the convention, that's the first step to making sure that not only do we have six elected officials, but we have a socialist agenda, both at the state level and then also at the city level too. It's crazy, man. I love, that's my favorite one. Well, I think that's a, a really great point. And I think the connection between both the New Deal for CUNY um, proposed legislative proposal that you're discussing and this proposal that passed and more broadly kind of maybe the, the sort of theory of change that you're proposing with a building working class organization with tenant organizations or my union, the PSC, is that through DSA, we can fuse these struggles together that with the, the elected officials like you that we have in office combined with the power of labor that we can push forward for transformative legislation that can change people's lives, but also the sort of building the sort of organizations that are willing to fight and maybe something like PSC going out on strike on coalition with DSA and our elected officials to make sure that that sort of proposal passes. I also find that the constituent organizing with with people seeing what's happening on the ground, being connected to it, provides a place to base build. Um, I brought this up during um, the convention. When I first came into DSA, I came in through the working group. Um, healthcare working group, where I had a little bit idea of what I was doing, but here, let me hold, like, you know, having people from the working group, like, literally hold my hand and say, this is how we build power. 
I think that when people come to the office, that's what they should be seeing. And that's why it's so important for DSA to come into the office in a way that shows people this is how people power, this is how power is built. It's not transactional. You don't have to scratch my back. It, does, it has nothing to do with me as your elected official per se, but rather me as a fellow comrade. And we're all in this together. So you're on the rally, you're at the rally, I'm at the rally. And we're all saying the same thing. And um, we're all following the same, um, I guess, operations manual, I don't know. <laughs> but the same strategies are shared. And it's nothing that I'm hogging for myself, you know. Um, with the constituent organizing, when we had the town halls, you, you clearly saw out of the town halls the need for more of it. Um, people were engaged. People were like, oh, okay, so Albany, this is how Albany works. This is how the city works. It's beautiful when we're able to share it together. And so. Well, this collective fight for power, and I think that's a great uh, point to end on. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts on uh, RPM. We're always happy to have you. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear from you again soon. Yes. Yes. So I'm here with Annie, who is back on RPM, I believe, for the third time that we have it. Second? All right. Uh, don't want to overestimate. <laughs> but um, so we're here at NYC DSA convention, and I just want to ask you, like, what proposal that are you really excited about that has passed uh, today? Well, I'm very excited about uh, a constitutional amendment that I uh, co-authored with RPM host uh, Amy Wilson to create uh, cultural organizations uh, in uh, in the chat and to allow cultural organizations like RPM and like uh, the choir Sing in Solidarity to uh, to formally join the chapter and to bring um, big cultural arts organizing uh, into socialism. It's a really exciting proposal, especially as someone who is a producer and host on RPM. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Annie. <laughs> So I'm here with Alex from a YDSA Hunter chapter, and um, he's kind of a leading, leading member of proposal to get NYC DSA to endorse a campaign for a new deal for CUNY, which as a PSC member is of uh, your special interest to me, uh, material interest. <laughs> so uh, Alex, what, why do you think the proposal is um, so important? Um, why does NYC DSA need to be fighting for a new deal for CUNY? Uh, well, the New Deal for CUNY would really make a material difference in the lives of thousands of CUNY students and professors. In addition to making CUNY free, it would uh, raise adjunct pay, hire more mental health counselors, invest in infrastructure. And as socialists, it's very important that we organize in CUNY. CUNY is 77% uh, people of color. It is overwhelmingly working class. And the, the people at CUNY are our future teachers and nurses uh, and, and teamsters. Uh, so we, this really presents an opportunity for us not just to win, a new deal for CUNY, but also really, uh, you know, harness the power of students and adjuncts. That sounds uh, like an essential campaign for us to be fighting for, to be building an alliance with labor and students, uh, whether that's uh, pushing for the legislation through lobbying or through a strike. So let's uh, uh, let's see how that goes. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. You're listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. Today we're talking about, first we were just hearing from NYC DSA Convention, and now we are going to be discussing a new deal for CUNY and the potential strategies around that, whether that's continuing to push politicians to pass that in Albany through lobbying or through a potential strike. We are joined by multiple members of PSC, including my Myself, but Rosa, Maya, and Jen, and also Alex from YDSA Hunter, who we just heard from in at NYC DSA convention. I just want to thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Well, I want to jump to a question that we normally uh, you know, throw at our guest uh, uh, every single episode of Revolutions Per Minute before we get into specifically the New Deal for CUNY legislation. So maybe I'll just throw this at uh, Rosa first, and then we can kind of just jump around the rest of the group. But um, what social forces propelled you into the movement for democratic socialism and for a strong and powerful union? Why are fighting working class organizations so crucial to our struggle for working class power, and what does CUNY mean to you and to New York City more broadly? Yeah, um, thank you so much. So I actually sort of grew up in DSA. I grew up in the left. My dad was in DSA. My mom was in the Committees of Correspondence. Um, But I joined DSA when Bernie ran. Um, And the reason is because that felt like a really significant shift where, uh, as a socialist, I had always felt very isolated from political movements in various ways. And this was a movement. And socialism is about movements. It's about people power. It's about getting people activated and engaged. And so um, Bernie is sort of what brought me into DSA most recently. And I think that same idea of needing a movement is why fighting for working class institutions is so important because you need the mass people um, to have the mass movement and showing dedication by being organized and good and winning fights, right? Um, like grandstanding and rhetoric is interesting, but ultimately sort of useless. Um, But getting in the trenches and fighting fights and winning fights for working class people as working class people is like an essential part of fighting for socialism. And when you're talking about New York City, I don't think, I mean, personally, I don't think there's an institution that better represents the working class of New York than CUNY. Of course, I'm very biased because I teach at CUNY now. I also went to CUNY as an undergraduate. I would not have gone to college without CUNY because I could not afford anything else. And that's true for so many people. When you think about CUNY students, faculty, staff, and our families, you're talking about the working class of New York. And so I'm very, very happy that DSA has taken up the New Deal for CUNY as a priority. Yeah, I think you hit on a a number of... uh one themes that we hear on the show that Bernie was crucial for pulling people into the movement for democratic socialism, but also that getting involved in the fight and actually building organization on the ground is how you make the sort of proposals that he originally pushed out, but something um, the more broad and encompassing program of DSA that is currently being pushed a reality through struggle. And I think uh, public education and CUNY in particular is the heart of the social democracy that exists at all here in this city and fighting for a far more all-encompassing democratic socialism. So, Maya, let me throw the same questions your way. Yeah, I mean, Rosa so eloquently um, articulated so many of the things that I would want to say um, about the importance of CUNY, Um, but I'll just speak sort of more personally to my personal story. I think I'm a lifelong New Yorker, so I'm somebody who, and that's something that I'm very, very proud of, but I also think that I'm somebody who has benefited in the long term from the sort of social mobility possibilities that are that CUNY um, facilitates. My grandmother was an alum of Brooklyn College, and I see what she was able to achieve um, in sort of being able to uh, ascend to the middle class um, as being very much uh, a product of her uh, CUNY degree. But I'll also say that for me, as somebody who came to CUNY for my graduate education, I saw, thinking sort of retrospectively, I see a few streams sort of, sort of, um, running parallel that I think brought me into DSA, um, and made, and politi- and, um, sort of aided in my politicization, which was, um, as Rosa was saying, the Bernie, uh, movement, his first political campaign, but then also becoming a CUNY student and teaching within CUNY, um, and then through CUNY getting involved in unionism through the PSC for the first time myself as a union member, but then also I think this is really important in terms of thinking about the larger context of a new deal for CUNY. This is also during sort of the nadir of the uh, fiscal crisis at CUNY. So I experienced this firsthand as a student in terms of the limited possibilities for me, 
even at sort of the upper, like the highest echelons of CUNY education um, as a PhD student at the Graduate Center. Uh, but then also in when I went out to the colleges um, to teach, is seeing um, how austerity was sort of um, affecting all aspects of life at CUNY. So I think it's all these sort of things happening um, at the same time that really made me um, more invested in CUNY, uh, the cause of CUNY, um, but also through this sort of understanding changing understanding of, of my own sort of political identity um, and would just want to reiterate what Rosa was saying in terms of um, why I think it's so great that DSA has taken on um, the cause of the New Deal for CUNY and the, you know, the larger fight for public higher education is sort of central um, to its political platform. Yeah, I think the lack of funding is is clear every day, and I think it's it makes it so central to any sort of program that um, the labor movement that DSA is fighting for to fight for full funding at a, a city university system like CUNY that is so crucial to millions of lives. Uh, Jen, I uh, just want to uh, direct those same uh, first questions uh, your way. Sure. Thanks so much. Um, so I am not – I did not grow up a New Yorker. Um, I uh, went to the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, as an undergraduate, and I'm a third-generation California state system, you know, public uh, public college, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, within my family, and have, have had that strong commitment to public college and, and intentionally choosing public college as part of my own family's legacy. But I'm 50 years old. I grew up in the area of left resentment, meaning there is no, there was no left. Right, so I got to go to school and study with amazing people like Angela, Angela Davis, and Wendy Brown, um, and so I got to see communists in the classroom, but not in the streets in the same way. And so, in some ways, like I feel like this is still a period of like elation and surprise <laughs> that that um, how much public space and to hear Farah, right, uh, you know, in the, at the opening of the show, this is still feels like a, a sort of like. Uh, really dramatic and exciting kind of dawn, and it's it's so, so exciting to be able to do these politics this way, right? And I think probably a lot of us like relate to that. The other thing about it is that you know, for <clears throat> for CUNY, the question of a New Deal for CUNY is a matter of not some kind of like race uplift, but it's a matter of racial justice. At the same time, I want every single person to choose to go to public college, just like my parents did and my grandparents did. Um, Hillary Clinton says she doesn't want to pay for rich kids to go to college. I think that's wrong. I think we want to pay for everybody to go to college. I think everybody should want to choose to go to public college the same way that I want everybody to ride a fare-free subway. And I don't think that we should then say that somehow public college is free because it's for the poor, right? And then, like, they go on in the next generation to go to Wesleyan. That is not what I want. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm for, for a strong public college for all. I think uh, strong public college for all should be the, the basis of, of any good society. And I think uh, I, I also share uh, your feelings and being very encouraged at the kind of the power that working class organizations are demonstrating at the moment in, in various uh, spheres of struggle. So, Alex, as our um, YDSA representative, I just uh, also want to give you a chance to uh, answer these questions before we move on to specifically the kind of what's within the New Deal for CUNY legislation. Uh, yeah, for sure. So like many people, Bernie was very influential in my political development. Uh, you know, when he ran in 2016, I was still in high school, but he um, I think he showed me two very crucial things. One, that not all Democrats are the same, uh, that, you know, simply electing Democrats is not necessarily good. But also even voting for the most left wing socialist candidates is not enough, that we need working class organizing and working class formations to create uh, real change. Uh, and in terms of CUNY, CUNY has really been a uh, part of my life as long as I can remember. Uh, my, my father's a, a CUNY professor at, at Queens College. Uh, and when it came time for me to, to choose to go to college, I really couldn't picture myself going anywhere else. You know, not only because I did not want to amass thousands of dollars of debt, but also uh, I, I wanted to, to really experience college in New York City. And there's no better way to do that than going to CUNY with other working class people that's, you know, uh, situated right right in the heart of the city. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the the existence of this, uh, you know, transformative working class institution that has been so crucial in providing education and connecting people so that they can understand their history, so they can get involved in further ways to build power for working people is so crucial in the lives of so many people, and it, it kind of provides a, a pathway to get a quality job that doesn't exist in so many places in this country. So, Jen, I, I want to direct these questions um, towards you, but uh, everyone else can feel free to chime in. So what is the New Deal for CUNY? How would it transform the lives of CUNY workers and students, and who is fighting for this transformative legislation? Well, the New Deal for CUNY is a piece of legislation that was introduced last year um, you know, uh, in, into the New York State Legislature. Um, and it's a piece, it's something that is, has, has existed on paper for almost 10 years in, in terms of it being a kind of um, policy goal. And it was, you know, really the changes in the New York State Legislature um, that led to the opportunity to really be able to present it and fight for it. Um, the New Deal for CUNY would do uh, a few different things. As we've talked about, it would make in-state public uh, undergraduate tuition free. And I think we would need to think about what it means for graduate tuition potentially down the road, like and with some degrees, like teaching and nursing, potentially become free or all graduate degrees. That's something for us to talk about. Um, it would set ratios for academic advisors and, and mental health counselors and regulate those ratios to make sure that there's enough per student. And I think New Deal for CUNY is a start that, but doesn't like go far enough. It would hire 5,000 additional new full-time faculty, including potentially con converting a bunch of existing adjunct positions into full-time lines. It would, what we are calling, professionalize the pay, meaning bring adjunct pay up to parity with a full-time lecture line, which would be a significant bump from where it is now. Um, and uh, it would also fulfill um, CUNY's capital request. You know, the capital request was something that uh, five or six years ago when we talked about it was sort of tacked on and easily could have been, like, set over to the side. And now we're in a pandemic, and we're so glad the capital request is there because, you know, right now we're in the middle of talking about what does it mean to not only have built, not built buildings for a couple generations, but what does it mean to not have it, not having retrofit those buildings? What does it mean for many of us to be working on floors where there is not mechanical HVAC and we're using windows for ventilation because it's like it's the same as if you're working in 1941. And so we really have the so the capital request that was once a kind of almost like afterthought or like a, a secondary thought is now like super important to our struggle. Um, the people that are fighting for the for uh, a new deal for CUNY um, are a broad coalition of people that have been assembled for a long time into something that we're, that's called CUNY Rising Alliance. In part, more than 42 different kinds of organizations like New York Communities for Change, DC 37, uh, NYPERG, but also a bunch of community organizations, and student organizations like YDSA. Um, a really broad coalition of people, and we want to tap not only the kind of like existing staff and faculty and students, but more than like a mil way, way, way more than a million alumni, right, who are part of the fabric of New York City. Everybody knows somebody who goes to CUNY, right? I mean, if you just take all those people and you put their family members together, we have a massive constituency. We have so much constituency power and we are not mobilizing it. Shame on us. So that's the work that we get to do now. I, th I think that's an excellent point that we can bring so many people together in this fight for a new deal for CUNY that there is this massive alumni base. There are all of these hundreds of thousands of students that there are the active working base of CUNY, uh, the membership of PSC over 30,000 and, and a total 45,000 workers, that there's a lot of power that can be demonstrated in this fight for a new, new deal for CUNY and a fight that can be for a lot more than just that. But I do want to remind our listeners that you are tuning in to Revolutions Per Minute. I'm listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. Today, we are talking about the struggle for a new deal for CUNY with members from PSC as well as from YDSA. But first, before we go back to our show, I just want to remind our listeners that this is a listener-funded station, and it's also a station that is democratically run. And it's crucial to fight for media like this in a day like today or really ever, as was uh, kind of reported on today. Uh, the mega corporation AT&T 
um, was actively involved in funding the fascist One American News Network. And so it's clear that capitalist media is interested in propagating the, the lies and the dangerous um, you know, power of the far right in this country and is trying to preserve a system in which capital dominates over labor and use sort of anti-democratic and racist strategies to preserve that power. We need a democratic socialist media that's connected to labor unions like PSC and socialist organizations like DSA. Just $25 a year makes you an eligible voting member alongside paid volunteers and staff. That means you can actively become a member of the local station board or support a slate to take over the local station board and become a huge influence over the station. Just imagine the over 30,000 PSC members being involved or all the media unions or the 9,000 DSA um, dues-paying members involved in, the, uh, in having a labor socialist media. So that's just something to think about as the power of um, capitalist media is something that needs to be taken on, and that's what we're doing here on Revolutions for a Minute. So I want to uh, you know, switch gears back to the New Deal for CUNY, and maybe I'll direct this first to um, Maya. Uh, just, I, want, I want to ask, how would the New Deal for CUNY transform uh, your life? Is this the moment to strike back against the Taylor Law as well, and are the rank and file ready to demonstrate our power and strike for New Deal for CUNY? Well, it's just to sort of position myself within the CUNY universe um, as I as a way to start answering your question. So I'm a graduate student at CUNY. Um, I'm getting my PhD at the Graduate Center in Art History, um, but I've also I don't I'm not currently working as an adjunct, but I worked as an adjunct in the system for over three years. So um, I can say that you know what a new, new deal for CUNY would mean for me, um, both as a student and as somebody who has taught and engaged with undergraduate students. So. From my perspective, um, as a graduate student, um, I think, you know, Jen did such an amazing job in sort of outlining this sort of holistic and systemic uh, approach of the legislation, and it would affect things for me, like um, her, her talking about physical plants of buildings, also things around hiring, um, you know, making sure that the, the schools are properly staffed with professors. Um, that's something that would mean a lot to me personally. But then also in thinking about the work that I have done as an adjunct to support myself through graduate school because of the meager pay that I was given um, as a PhD student, um, it would have made a, having a higher pay as an adjunct would have a, a major impact, um, would have had a major impact on the quality um, of my life and uh, from a material perspective, but also in terms of things like mental health. Um, how you know, Being a graduate student is extremely stressful, but so much of that stress um, is from the precarity of, of the position. Um, but I would also say that, for me, the thing that's most important about the New Deal for CUNY is how it would transform the learning conditions um, for the working class of New York City. Um, and again, this, as Jen pointed out, it's really a holistic approach, um, changing the conditions of learning in the classroom um, can change, changing um, who can afford to go to school um, and who can afford to go to school without having to take on, um, you know, multiple full t- multiple part time or if not full time jobs um, in order to support themselves through school, um, things of that nature, and also just knowing how um, economic precarity can affect mental health. Um, you know how the, the importance, the emphasis placed on um, hiring. Uh, mental health staff in the the university is also, I think, an extremely important part um, of the legislation. In terms of um, the what's necessary to build union power um, in order to um, fight for the new New Deal for CUNY, I think one of the things that's really important to emphasize is that the type of coalition building that then that, that Jen described um, in talking about CUNY Rising Alliance, and we're talking about um, leveraging sort of the larger CUNY community within the within um, New York City. That type of coalition building was also going to be necessary amongst members in the PSC in order to build the union power necessary to fight for, for um, something like the New Deal for CUNY. So, um, you know, there are many different types of constituencies within the PSC, people occupying many different um, professional ranks from full-time distinguished professors um, to adjuncts and um, instructional uh, staff. So I think it's also really important that we acknowledge the different positions that we're coming from within our own union and find ways to have conversations to build power and, and support um, 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 amongst our ranks, which I think is something that um, we try to do within the union. It's a very inclusive space, but I think we can always um, do a better job for sure. 
yeah, I think those are really great points and the kind of need to constantly be building um, coalitions among the various uh, layers of the rank and file. So, Rosa, I want to direct this uh, same questions your way. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> the New Deal for CUNY, I mean, it would just be money. I mean, it would be money and job security and economic security. I mean, there are months that we have a hard time making rent because I work as an adjunct. And there's something kind of obscene about that, um, that anybody should. Um, yeah, so, I mean, like a real, I'm very invested in the new deal for CUNY. I'd really like a lot more economic stability. I mean, that's what we all want. That is what we are fighting for. Um, I think that, I mean, of course, also, I mean, just the conditions, the working conditions at CUNY are so rough. The escalators, so I teach at Hunter. The escalators don't work at Hunter, so you often have to take extremely crowded elevators that are very unsafe or walk up, like, millions of flights of stairs. And that's been true since I went to Hunter as an undergrad. Like, those escalators have never worked. (laughs) And, um, yeah, I mean, and, of course, the mental health advisors and student services, I... Every semester, every semester since I've, I've been teaching at, at CUNY um, since 2012. And every semester I've taught, I've had a student who um, whose family was about to be evicted, who needed to go on food stamps, who were facing deportation, a risk of deportation. I mean, the, the structural stress, really, that students live under um, is hard to dramatize. It's hard to overstate. It's so real and it's so bare. Um, And so all of those things are just why this legislation is so important. Um, You know, in terms of the Taylor law and striking, I think I think that as a union, it's our job to get members to a place where we can pose a credible strike threat, um, because that's what where our power lies is in mobilizing members towards that end. Um, But I don't think we're there yet. I think we have a lot more internal organizing and internal work to do. And I think mobilizing around this legislation is an important step in getting to that place. I think it's part of the same project. It's part of the same working class organization building. Um, So, yeah. I think that's an excellent point that having this sort of political demand that addresses all of these concerns that are across the rank and file, the sort of struggles that people go through day to day, the lack of funding in the buildings, that organizing around a new deal for CUNY and the threat and then the potential action of getting um, the rank and file out in the street for a new deal for CUNY in alliance with the students and the alumni could totally transform the city. And I want to get back to this question, but we do have a clip that we have to roll to. But before we get to that clip, I just want to remind our listeners that our phone lines are going to be opened up as soon as we get back, and you can just give a call at 212-209-2877. That number is 212-209-2877. If you want to call in about the New Deal for CUNY, how that transform your lives, please give a call. But let's go to our interview with Amy Wilson and Lower Hudson Valley DSA on Jamal Bowman's recent uh, disappointing vote on funding the Israeli Iron Dome. Hey, what's up, New York City? This is Amy Wilson. On September 23rd, the United States House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly in support of a bill providing $1 billion in funding to Israel's Iron Dome. While DSA members Corey Bush and Rashida Tlaib voted no on this bill, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gave a vote of present, while Representative Jamal Bowman of New York 16 voted yes. In response, Representative Bowman's home DSA chapter of Lower Hudson Valley released a statement condemning the vote. The DSA National Political Committee also called on DSA's elected officials to follow the Palestinian-led call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel, a movement that was endorsed by DSA at our national convention in 2017. I spoke to Andrew and Jeremy of Lower Hudson Valley DSA. So the bill was a last minute effort to increase the funding to the Iron Dome. Um, the Iron Dome is the Israeli defense system, defense in quotation marks. 
um, that they've been using uh, to really enforce Israel's siege and blockade on Gaza for the last 15 years. Um, and, and so that was in addition uh, to the already the about like $1.7 billion, which the U.S. funds to the Iron Dome specifically. So talk to me a little bit uh, in depth about your specific chapter situation of having this representative, a, a powerful representative in, in Congress who's taken a vote that is not in line with other principles, shall we say, that have been endorsed by, by DSA. So how did that play out for you? It's all a very simple process. Like I just posted a screenshot into our chapter Slack about um, the vote and being disappointed and a lot of chapter members came around it saying we should write a statement and really condemn his actions because um, they're not in line with like the socialist principles we want our electors to have when they're in office. Um, yeah, so uh, we wrote up a quick draft. Uh, a, a bunch of members contributed like word choices and making sure that we were correctly representing the group. Um, and then uh, it quickly went to the steering committee for a vote. Um, I think they voted on it unanimously in support of releasing the statement, um, which was a really great step to see. Um, and they voted on making sure the wording was in line with uh, views. So, so we had debates on should this be a condemnation of the Congress as a whole? How much should this statement be focused on Bowman? And how much should this be like the general failure of U.S. imperialism and the general violence that the U.S. propagates around the world? And as as a member of, uh, of the steering committee, I'll also add that... Um that since we had this democratic uh, debate among membership, um, by the time it was officially brought brought to us, um, the me- membership had already fine tuned it to what they wanted. So at that point, it was basically uh, just a stamp of approval. Uh, so credit to the membership. Yeah, that's that's absolutely what we love to see, and and this is a bit of a unprecedented moment for DSA in our, our modern history to, to be in the position of having disagreements, having tension, having friction with the elected officials that we've endorsed and worked with closely, right? Not, that's not, not just an endorsement. It's also a, a relationship. So talk to me a little bit as much as you can um, say about what you would like to see from Representative Bowman. There are some chapters that have dealt with this tension before. Um, like I'm thinking of Chicago DSA when uh, their council person voted for the COP austerity budget. And so like, I think in many ways, Bowman's like the first national figure to do this, but we, we are trying to follow these leaders of people who have you know, really taken what it means to be a socialist elected into account. Um, and yeah, Chicago DSA the first to come to mind. And, and then I think on the question of what do we demand from Bowman and, you know, DSA members and ordinary people to do photos, I think BDS is... It's a call. This is a call to action. Yeah, I think we want to see Representative Bowman endorse BDS wholeheartedly. Um, you can't be a socialist and not support BDS. I think it's, it's the line. It's Socialism is an international process, and thus international solidarity means you're supporting the Palestinian call to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. So in addition to that, um, in the past, some um, the BDS, so uh, National BDS so Working Group and other um, other pro-Palestinian uh, justice uh, organizations have um, have had conversations with him. So so from our end, uh, we'd like to see him really, really kind of listen to those conversations. What would you say to the people who tell you that it's just a no-go for Representative Bowman, given the uh, district that he represents? How would you respond to that? I think that means that you're looking at a constituency for Bowman that's not the constituency of the district. The majority of the district is still people of color and it's still a working class district where, you know, supporting BDS will by no means knock you off the ballot or make it hard to hard to win those votes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As so, as socialists, uh, we're you know, our goal our our victory isn't gonna come through like wealthy places like Scarsdale. Um uh this campaign really really did well with uh, black voters, for example. Um, so just at a glance, that tells me, like, the victory really came forth in places like Yonkers. Um, and then just just to talk about my personal experience when I did some canvassing for him, um, those are the places we were hitting, like uh, Yonkers, uh, Mount Vernon, 
um, place, places like that, um, I think, re- which really aren't taken into consideration, like diverse working class areas that really get left out of the conversation. So I, I think we really need to be centering these, ki- these kinds of communities in the conversation. You just heard Andrew and Jeremy of Lower Hudson Valley DSA on their decision to condemn Representative Jamal Bowman for his yes vote on increased U.S. military aid to Israel. Let's go back to Jack in the studio to conclude tonight's show. Uh, You're listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. Today, we're talking about a new deal for CUNY and organizing for a potential political strike to make that happen. Our phone lines are open. Please call us at 212-209-2877. Again, that number is 212-209-2877. So uh, just relatedly uh, to our last segment, I just want to um, let our listeners know that PSC have recently endorsed a BDS campaign against Israeli apartheid, which spurred the resignation of 50 right-wing professors who signed a resignation letter if the union endorsed that campaign. Uh, so we, while we're waiting to speak with some callers, I just want to ask um, – uh, some of our uh, fellow, my fellow PSC members, why is it so important for unions like PSC to have a firm commitment to anti-imperialist politics? What does this resolution reveal about how union leadership has been transformed by a combination of rank and file strategy and a growing democratic socialist movement? Um, how about I, uh, I'll direct that to Rosa. <laughs> um, so, I think that, well, to answer the second question first, I'll start. Um, I think our union has been very effectively moved and organized through rank and file, very intensive rank and file organizing, um, and through coordination with DSA or other socialist movements uh, in a variety of ways. This resolution was sort of an example of that, um, although I would I would actually say less so than other things, other things that we're working on, like the New Deal for CUNY legislation. Um, there's actually more than 50 people that have resigned as a result of the resolution. And while I supported the resolution, I think it highlights a problem where... There's a bit of a romanticization of the working class and of unions. There's this idea that, um, you know, we're the PSC, we're a social justice union, and so we're all allied on a variety of social justice fronts. And that's really not true. Um, CUNY has a really ugly history of Islamophobia, and yet, for example, this resolution didn't mention that when it was first introduced. It talked about international issues. It talked about, um, you know, Israel as an apartheid state. And while I share that analysis, I think the question for us as unionists and as a union with working class people in it, representing the working class, a working class constituency, um, we have to ask ourselves, what is this resolution doing that's speaking to that population? Um I mean, the resolution passed through the procedures that we have. Uh, so I'm not trying to say that it was necessarily only representing minority votes or that or minority voices or that um, anything like that. But the fallout from the resolution highlights a real political conflict in our union. And I think it's important to confront those conflicts, right? I mean, we can't just like ignore them. Um, But I think that there could and should have been better strategy 
around confronting those contradictions, if I'm being quite honest. That, that's um, a really, I don't want to cut you off. I'm, uh, that's, no, sure. that's a really great point. We just do have a caller on the yeah. line, so I want to make sure we get to them before the end of the show. But I think you're hitting on a point that you're making before that it, it's also related to an organizing problem. You need to be mm, organizing yes. and pushing yes. and bringing the union together. Right. I, uh, you are live on WBAI and Revolutions Per Minute. What's your name and what's your uh, comment or question? Hi, Jack. Uh, my name is Tom Waters, um, and I am uh, an adjunct um, working at CUNY. And uh, full disclosure, I'm an activist in the union, and I know um, at least two or three of the, uh, of the panelists. And I'm glad that they discussed uh, the recent Palestine resolution, because I couldn't agree more with what Rosa just said about it. I think it highlights certain fissures and certain fault lines in the union. But extrapolating from that, I think you can look at those fault lines as also being applicable to the question of uh, striking, which, which you brought up earlier. Um, I think that, uh, and I'm a DSA member uh, as well, and I think uh, one of the things that DSA has become really good at um, is a kind of analysis of electoral campaigns. And one of those places where there might be a little bit of a deficit, even in New York City, which has a labor tradition, is of analysis of labor conflicts, right? Um, uh, the, the, the PSC um, is a union that represents both um, uh, adjuncts who are exploited laborers and people who are pretty well off. And so um, I, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of the New Deal for Kenya. I think it would be transformative for the institution and that it would support the education of the working class of New York. But if listeners, uh, especially socialists and DSA members, are following this, I think it's instructive to look at the composition of the union itself and see where um, we might struggle to get to the level of radicalism that we might um, uh, expect or we would want to see. And so I, I, I kind of keep that in mind when we're talking about the, the tailor law and what it would take to challenge this. And I like the idea of uh, appealing to alumni and other uh, community members but I just want listeners to, to keep that in mind that unions function um, in a way, especially contemporary American unions that don't necessarily have a lot of contemporary socialist DNA, even if they have some in the past. You know, there was a movement among adjuncts in the last PSC contract in 2018 to strike for not even comparable wages to full-timers. I, I don't want to cut you off because this is a really, yeah. really great point, but we are coming to the end of our show. And oh, I think sure, I, sure, I, sure. And I just want to thank all of our guests. I want to thank uh, a great call in. I just uh, I think that's a really, really great point to end on, that we need to be, as a union, uh, pushing forward a, a set of demands that can unite um, us all in the struggle with an awareness that there are fissures and it's not going to be easy to unite uh, around a struggle that is a demonstration of power that will actually uh, do what we needs to be done to win uh, the New Deal for CUNY and much, much more um, in the city of New York. Um, so I just want to thank everyone so much, and uh, we will be um, back on uh, on WBAI in two weeks, and uh, we will be talking a lot more about the rising labor activity that is happening here in New York and all across the country. We'll see you out in the work place in the neighborhoods out on the streets this has been jack divine with revolutions per minute